and welcome to the Wharton Fintech podcast. I am your host Taran Gupta and our guests today are Michelle Alt and Jonah Crane from the Claros Group. Claros Group is an advisory and investment firm at the intersection of innovation, financial services and regulation. Michelle is a co-founder and partner at Claros and she advises fintech clients on their banking and regulatory strategies by drawing on her previous experience at Promontory Financial Group and as a senior legal official at the US office of the controller of the currency. Jonah is a partner at Claros and he advises on business and product strategy, regulatory and compliance risk and regulatory engagement. He has helped neo banks, infrastructure providers, crypto companies and banks navigate complex regulatory frameworks. He served as a senior advisor and deputy assistant secretary in the US Treasury Department and as an advisor to the US Senator Chuck Schumer. Join us as we discuss the disruptions and regulations in fintech, potential for merger and acquisition opportunities due to the economic downturn, what led to the failure of SVB and its expected impact on banking and fintech industries and much more. Hope you enjoy the show. Hey Michelle, hey Jona, how are you? Hey Trey, I'm good. Thanks. Oh, how are you? Doing well. So where are you joining us from? I'm in the Bay Area, in California. And I'm in uh, Capitol Hill in Washington DC. Okay, that's an interesting location. Like do you stay there or are you there for work? <laughs> no, this is where I live. I've been in Washington DC for almost 14 years. I still call New York home, but I think I'm only fooling myself. <laughs> Uh, I think the I know the obvious answer here, but New York or DC, what do you like more? I miss New York, but uh, I have young kids now, so DC is better for that. I think makes sense. All right, let's start with the questions. So, for Michelle and Jonah, this is for both of you. Could you tell our listeners a bit about your career and what got you involved in fintech? Sure. So, I mean, the short answer is, you know, I uh, was in the government for about seven and a half years until the end of the Obama administration. And when I left the administration, um, I had to figure out what to do next. And I was um, much more interested in working with people who were building the future of financial services than anything else I could think about. And so I really just tried to meet as many people as I could in that space. And that's how I wound up here sort of as a consultant by accident in the fintech space. But it was really, really that desire to work on the future of financial services. Like Jonah, I was uh, in the government for a long time, longer than Jonah. But uh, if you could see us, it would be obvious, but you're only listening. So uh, I was in the government for a long time, which I loved and we can talk about later. But, you know, the interesting thing about government work is really understanding the role you have in policy and how it shapes um, real world uh, impacts. And uh, I was very familiar um, with how it shapes banking and then seeing how it was also shaping and creating new business models in fintech was just fascinating. I really wanted to to work on, on issues involving uh, that impact. So, Michelle, sort of building on that, you spent over 20 years at the office of the control for the currency, right? Yeah. So what were some key banking regulations or policy changes that you were a part of? Really proud of the work I did with my colleagues at the OCC, but I, I'll try and focus on a couple of big categories here. One was federal preemption of state law. So we have an insanely complicated financial regulatory system. We have multiple federal agencies with overlapping jurisdictions, and that is made even more complicated by um, sort of a crazy quilt of state and local regulate regulators and and their regulations, right? At the OCC, I was very involved in legal efforts and the challenges to those efforts to bring clarity to that mess through the application of the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which states essentially that federal law is the supreme law of the land. But that's a long story. And then the other big category, I would say, uh, involved uh, the Dodd-Frank Act. I was involved in many, many rulemaking projects to implement various aspects of the massive Dodd-Frank law that was enacted after 
financial crisis. And it was really challenging and important work. And it felt really urgent at the time because, you know, the country and the financial sector was really hurting then. For Jonas, so the, the, my question is that you have also focused a lot on policymaking, but you are involved more in innovation and financial inclusion. So why did you pick that niche? And uh, like, what was the motivation behind that? Yeah, I mean, I think as the as the sort of fintech wave was really building in the 2010s, regulators around the world were faced with a bit of a conundrum, which was how to think about some of these new products, some of which didn't fit neatly into existing uh, sort of boxes or regulatory regimes. And so there's a lot of work going on really around the world by regulators uh, to figure out how can we adopt more flexible frameworks? How can we adopt, you know, regulatory sandboxes became a thing in the in the middle of the 20 teens, right? And it was really the idea of how can we create a safe space for some experimentation to happen where consumers can be protected and, you know, we can basically try to see whether there's a new way to deliver a financial product or a new a new delivery mechanism or a new disclosure regime uh, that might be able to work better. Um, and how do we create the safe space for that experimentation to take place? The inclusion angle was really um, uh, driven by the fact that a lot of this work uh, for me um, for, for, for a few years took place overseas, where innovation was really the key to unlocking access to basic banking services for a huge portion of the population. And so I ended up doing a couple projects for the Gates Foundation, one in Nigeria and one in Indonesia, working with financial regulators to try to figure out how they could really adapt their own processes and systems to encourage innovation. Uh, But the core goal was always financial inclusion and to bring the relatively large portion of the populations in those countries that remain underbanked into the more formal banking system and establish a, a, a foothold with basic banking accounts. So could you also shed some light on how does a regulation or a legislation go from an idea to actually being implemented? What's the process <laughs> like? Yeah, well, Michelle is the expert on that process. Um, I think suffice it to say there are infinite, uh, infinite variety uh, of ways it can happen. I think the big question uh, I always start with is, Um, is there something that the regulators can do within their current authorities? Um, And if they can, uh, you know, how to impress upon them that it should be something at the top of their priority stack. If it's not something regulators can do uh, within their current authorities, then you have to go to the legislature. And that is often a much harder task. And getting something up to the top of their stack is often difficult to impossible unless there's a crisis. Um, Legislatures tend to respond to crises Um, And, you know, we may be seeing uh, a new version of that play out now in the wake of the banking volatility recently. But, you know, really a lot of the vast majority of financial regulation we've seen historically in the United States came as a result of uh, responses to financial crises of one sort or another. Um, And so that's that's really how new laws get implemented. And then within the bounds of those new laws, you know, regulators over time make adjustments and tweaks, but there are limits to what they can do. Now, switching to like. Uh, your current roles. Can you share a bit about what Claros Group is, what kind of work do you do, and what kind of clients do you? Well, sure. So um, Claros Group is an advisory and investment firm. We uh, focus on the future of financial services. We, on the advisory side, tend to focus, all of our work comes down to one basic question, right? If you're a company like FinTech that does not itself have a banking license. How do you offer banking services in the U.S.? And so we work trying with FinTechs primarily, but not exclusively. We, we I would say maybe Jonah, 70% FinTech, 30% bank for FinTechs to partner with existing banks to offer their services. We work on um, entering the banking system, either through getting a, for FinTech to get a license itself as a new bank called a de novo bank, or we work on M&As for FinTechs to buy banks. And sometimes we work with banks who are interested in buying FinTechs or parts of FinTech businesses. Uh, So as you mentioned, right, Michelle, that you work a lot with FinTechs and a lot with banks as well. My question to you is that uh, regulations you see are generally slow to catch up with fintech innovations. So when you're working with fintech companies that don't have clear regulatory guidelines around them, but are large enough or have raised significant capital, 
what do you do to sort of mitigate that regulatory risk or uncertainty? Yeah. So, Torin, we often advise fintechs, as I said, that are interested in entering the banking system one way or another, right? And we advise those clients, start thinking like a bank, right? Focus on risk management and compliance, right? Develop a risk governance framework, develop a risk appetite statement, pay special attention to, for example, BSA, right? Bank Secrecy Act compliance. And growth is terrific, but don't forget about profitability, right? And finally, what I always say to my clients is that although the tech world has worshipped the move fast, break things ethos, guess what regulators hate? Fast moving, breaking things, right? You, you really have to start thinking like a bank. So sort of uh, taking on that, Jonah, my question to you is that recently the economic uncertainty and the general macroeconomic environment has not been kind to financial services and fintech in particular, right? And there has been conversation around that there might be a lot of m and activity going on or potentially in the future. What's your take on this and what are some clear opportunities that you see? Yeah, I mean, I, definitely with the market environment uh, sort of changing on a dime in 2022 uh, and the, the, the entire tech sector in general, but the fintech sector in particular really being hit quite hard. I think public fintechs were down something like 70% last year, many of them over 90%. It seemed, and, and with private markets also um, cooling off quite a bit, uh, it seemed like there were likely to be a number of fintechs who would reach the end of their runway without having achieved milestones that would allow them to raise new money at attractive valuations. And so in those circumstances, m and seem like a logical outcome. Now, whether it's the outcome we would actually see will depend on a lot of factors other, other than logic, perhaps. You know, the psychology of the founding teams and the investors, for one thing. And the big, the big question was always whether you could find agreement between buyers and sellers on a price and evaluation that would uh, sort of make sense for both sides. And so then you sort of have to ask, ask yourself, well, who's the buyer here? And, you know, public company buyers were going to be uh, a bit uh, a bit stretched because, as we just discussed, their stock prices uh, got hit uh, even more than uh, than the private market uh, companies did. For a little while, it felt like banks were likely to be buyers. Um, it would, you know, in theory, be a good opportunity for a regional bank to accelerate their uh, digital transformation strategy by buying one or more fintechs. I think the last few weeks have probably made that a difficult thing for them to focus on and put at the top of their priority stack for the board and the senior management for the next little while. And so now you're left with, well, what, what other private fintechs could become acquirers uh, in this market? And we just saw a deal that I think is interesting and may point the way to the future with Acorns buying Go Henry in an all-stock deal. So a private company using its stock as an acquisition vehicle, I think that was an acquisition currency. I think that was sort of an interesting data point and, and, and may point the way forward. You asked about opportunities, and I think there are a couple I'll highlight, um, although, again, it's a bit of a, a changing space. One, in 2020 and 2021, there were a lot of copycat fintechs started and funded, right? You, and, and now you have really dozens of uh, companies in the fraud space, AML space, uh, identity and authentication. Um, and at some point, uh, a roll-up of a number of those companies would at least make logical sense, right? So if you're one of the more successful or stronger players in that space, buying up some companies that uh, have built solutions or have uh, useful teams that are sort of adjacent to your core offering would allow you to move from more of a point solution towards uh, being more of a platform provider um, and could position you well for the future. So I think I think that sort of roll-up strategy still makes sense. Again, whether you can find the buyers with the appetite uh, and ability to leverage either uh, their cash resources or their stock as a currency and whether you can come to agreement with the sellers on price remains a big question. And look, for those brave banks out there who can walk and chew gum at the same time and deal with the current volatility in the market and focus on their strategic opportunities, there there still is a lot of opportunity out there and they, they could become winners through this process. But it's going to be it's going to be a real challenge given the current environment. One fascinating thing about that you said is the, the merger between Acon, right? Like, it was a private all stock deal, and private markets we know are a lot less liquid and a lot less, a lot more opaque than public markets are. What would be your concern as someone on the econ's uh, financial team when you get such, bring such a deal? Like, how do you expect the investors to react to it? Yeah, I think I mean the 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 nice thing about being in the private markets is that 
you only need a handful of players to agree on the valuation or the price, right? And you don't have to convince uh, your entire public stockholder base to go along with that negotiated price. And you can maybe look through the current market, market environment and take a longer term perspective around valuation. I think as a buyer, what you're really looking to do in this situation is make sure that you're only paying for the value that the seller, either through technology or their team, brings to the table and that you're not sort of overpaying for the, quote, synergies and, and other, you know, sort of soft stuff that is often thrown around in these M&A deals to justify higher, higher prices. So I think maintaining discipline on the buyer side and from the seller side, looking for a fair price, but being realistic about the fact that just because you were valued at a billion dollars in 2021 doesn't mean that's what your company was actually worth. Now, turning over to the industry overall, uh, I think this question is something I have to ask since your expertise is in banking. What is your opinion on the recent SVB and other regional uh, banks failing or coming under threat, right? What do you see could have been done better? And was it just poor risk management or poor duration management that caused this? Or was there more than meets the eye? My view is um, this was bread and butter interest rate management, uh, risk management failure, and apparent regulatory failure. There's a lot of talk going on about, you know, regulators should have more authority or they were hamstrung by this or that, or, you know, rules, Dodd-Frank rules had been rolled back, et cetera. But the regulators have ample authority and information at their disposal to respond to risks at banks. And the finger pointing has certainly begun. But I wouldn't look for, you know, that sort of, if you hear hubs, think horse, not zebra. Here, I think horse. You know, it, this was a very, this was a known risk. And uh, SVB seems to have mismanaged it. And, you know, I do have questions about what the regulators were doing with the information they had at their hand, at their disposal. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot left to be learned about exactly what happened here. Clear case of poor risk management, likely some supervisory failures. I just deeply suspect, though, that the last chapter has not been written on this banking crisis or uh, the collapse of SVB. We still have large holes in bank balance sheets that need to be filled. Uh, over $500 billion in deposits have left the banking system altogether. Uh, billions more have been reallocated within the banking system, leaving some banks reliant on uh, funding from the Fed. Uh, we have a looming commercial real estate problem that could hit small and regional banks. So a lot left to work through. And, you know, I, I worry a little bit that if we're not proactive in working through those issues, uh, there could be echoes of, you know, the early days of the SNL crisis in the 1980s. Um, but we're probably getting ahead of ourselves. Um, I could speculate about this for, uh, for hours, but uh, perhaps of more immediate interest to your fintech audience, I thought I'd touch on a couple, uh, a couple topics that are sort of directly relevant to the SBB fallout. First, Obviously, we were already in a period where risk appetite uh, and funding markets for startups had uh, been reined in as the Fed raised interest rates. That will obviously be exacerbated. We could even see a bit of a credit crunch. Jay Powell and Jamie Dimon have talked about that in recent weeks. And, you know, if that ends up hurting economic growth and undermining confidence, that will have sort of secondary impacts on, on the startup sector for sure. But more directly, you know, Silicon Valley Bank banked like half of all venture backed companies in the country. Um, and the VC and startup sector will now be viewed as sort of risky customers for banks. So founders are going to have to focus on banking relationships and making sure that they have some redundancy there and there are no single points of failure in a way that maybe they didn't in the past. They're going to have to prioritize having a CFO or a treasurer or, you know, plugging into a treasury management solution, which I can come back to in a moment. For fintech specifically, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, played a very important role in the ecosystem. They connected many fintechs to payment systems. Um, they facilitated complex payment operations. We heard about the challenges that companies like Bill.com faced over that failure weekend. They were really one of only a few banks that can move large amounts of money quickly and accurately. Ironically, perhaps that contributed to their rapid downfall. They successfully moved $42 billion in deposit withdrawals in about 24 hours after all. But the upshot for the fintech sector is that those capabilities are not likely to be replaced anytime soon. There's an opportunity out there for an enterprising bank who wants to serve the fintech sector to step up and sort of be a replacement for Silicon Valley Bank there, but it's not going to happen overnight. Finally, I think there's 
a real opportunity for the fintech sector. Um, I think not just startups, but really all of corporate America are rethinking treasury management, really how they manage their cash. Um, and a lot of fintechs have already benefited from this. Mercury, Brex, Meow, Modern Treasury, and others uh, have seen large flows across their platforms uh, as companies really rethink how do they spread their cash around, how do, they, how do they diversify into treasuries and money market funds, and reduce their exposure to uninsured deposits. So I think those treasury management players uh, have a real opportunity ahead of them. I think the traditional deposit networks like Interfi and Reich and Tang will play an important role. And I think the banking as a service players have a real opportunity here too. We've already seen Unit and Treasury Prime leverage their bank partners together with deposit networks to offer up to $50 million in deposit insurance for companies. Um, and I think the, the banking as a service providers who can service fintechs and support fintechs uh, with multiple bank integrations and providing redundancy uh, will have an advantage going forward. Think unit, solid, treasury prime, et cetera. More broadly, when you step back, you know, when banks get conservative, there's opportunity for fintechs, right? And we are certainly entering a period when banks are going to be uh, more conservative going forward. So fintechs should really stay alert to where the opportunities uh, may arise. Sort of follow on to that, I read an article today which sort of showed that there has been a record, record outflow of funds from regional banks, right? So putting our m and lenses on, do you feel that there's a lot of like upcoming consolidation happening in the banking sector with maybe the five major banks absorbing a significant number of regional banks? So I do think there will be, uh, you know, consolidation is definitely one of the outcomes here, right? Um, uh, if, if, if a large regional bank has no obvious path forward, it will have to get bought either in whole or in pieces um, by other institutions. Um, and as I said a moment ago, uh, you know, with deposits flowing out of the regional uh, banking sector in particular, but out of, you know, out of a number of banks, um, you know, a couple things are true. One, as I said before, they're going to have to replace that funding with something else. It's going to be more expensive. So the profitability of banks will be squeezed. And like I said, they could even be upside down in terms of their funding costs. Um, and, uh, you know, Two, the, the bank's capacity to, to, to generate credit, to make loans, is going to be significantly constrained. And I think this is, this is an area that we're going to have to really monitor going forward, right? Banks uh, support the economy principally by making loans. They make those loans principally off of a deposit base. And if, if the deposit base of the banking sector is going to shrink over time, and it very well might with uh, businesses being a lot more mindful about uh, where they put their money and how exposed they are to uninsured balances, you know, that could significantly reduce the capacity of the banking sector to support the economy uh, through lending. We've seen hundreds of billions of dollars flow out of the banking system already. That is basically hundreds of billions of dollars in loans that they cannot make. So I think um, that that bears watching and I'm, I'm certain policymakers are going to be paying attention to it. Makes sense. For the last segment, what I'd like to do is introduce you both as individuals or as person or people to our listeners. And I have a couple of rapid fire questions lined up for you both. My first question goes to both of you. What is a fun fact about you that most people do not know? Boy, well, I don't know. I played high school basketball and I was injured for most of my senior year. I had a cast on my left foot, but I was determined to play in the end of year tournament. So I entered the three point contest and ended up winning it, hopping around on one foot, which is kind of a, maybe a fun fact, but also a sad <laughs> fact in the sense that my, the highlight of my senior basketball season was spent in a cast. <laughs> okay. So here's one for me that a lot of people don't know. So when I graduated from high school, I was 16. I graduated early and I just wasn't ready to go to college. You know, I was just a kid. And back then, gap years didn't exist. So I just announced right before, I mean, like the week before it was my parents were going to drive me to college that I wasn't going. And instead, I was going to go work on an organic dairy farm in upstate New York. They were very unhappy, very, very unhappy. So I did that um, just to show my parents because I didn't want to say they were right. And that is the hardest I've ever had to work, ever. It kind of compared to having like newborn babies. It was terrible <laughs> and very messy. <laughs> wow. So you did that and then you ended up going to college eventually. Yeah, I, I did. I eventually went to college and I went to law school and I led a pretty uh, more conventional life. Uh, Jonas, so you, are, you have extensive experience of working with fintechs. 
and you must have understood a lot of business models by now. Aren't you tempted to go try your hand at launching your own fintech startup? Well, I guess I'm glad I didn't do it in 2021 because things have been a little bit hard. But look, I think that just highlights that it's a it's a risky venture, and you know maybe that's a, maybe that's a path I'll go down in the future. Obviously, for now we're trying to we're trying to build something here at Claros, and that's what I'm focused on. But it is it is interesting, and I think um, you know I think getting uh, uh, I enjoy the part of one of the parts of my job now that I really find interesting is sort of rolling up my sleeves with the client and and really sort of becoming an extension of their team and trying to help them work through issues. And so I can. Uh, whether I find myself on the other side of the table someday to be determined, but it does take, uh, does take, does take some risk appetite and some, uh, some real entrepreneurial desire to do that. And actually I do think just to echo what Jonah said, one of the really interesting things I think we bring to the table at Claros is we're a startup too, right? We are entrepreneurs. We're trying to ourselves build a better mousetrap. You know, we, we respect FinTechs for trying to, provide better service to their customers. And that's what we're trying to do too. Makes sense. For my last question, I would like to get both of your opinion on the strength of the American economy. With the current interest rates, the issue with the debt ceiling, do you believe that on a foundational level, the American economy is still sound? And is there that something that needs to be done to make sure that this sort of like the growth or the well-being of the economy is sustained for the long term? So, look, fundamentally, the U.S. economy seems pretty strong and resilient, right? Just a few weeks ago, we were having a big debate about whether it was still too strong and too hot and how fast the Fed was going to have to raise interest rates to cool demand. And so I think, you know, the economy uh, continues to show strength. Um, you know, we, we recovered rapidly after the crisis due to, you know, significant government support. I think government policies have gotten better over the last 15 years in responding to crises. And, and we responded really quickly to, to the last one. There are challenges ahead. I mentioned some challenges in the banking sector a little while ago. Um, but ultimately, our banking system and our, our financial markets more broadly in the United States are very resilient. A lot of the risk capital that goes to work in our economy every day exists outside the banking systems. There are multiple uh, you know, multiple places for entrepreneurs to go and find that risk capital. Um, we're not entirely reliant on the banking system like some countries are. So I'm reasonably optimistic about the path forward. I think you mentioned the debt ceiling. And that sort of highlights to me that, you know, really only we can screw this up. Um, I mean, there are certainly things we can do on the policy side uh, that would really, um, you know, cause problems in the financial system and the economy. And Failing to deal responsibly with the debt ceiling is probably top on that list right now. The Fed has their homework cut out for them. But again, I think they largely learned the lessons of the post-financial crisis period when the recovery was sort of long and drawn out and too slow. They perhaps overlearned those lessons in the wake of the pandemic, and they're just trying to course correct. And it's it's a challenge, but I don't, I think they've got their hands firmly on the steering wheel. So, uh, you know, with a footnote about the debt ceiling aside, I think we're still in a, in a, in a reasonably a uh, strong place. And even if we were to encounter a bit of a recession this year, like I said, our our markets and our economy have been incredibly resilient through the last couple of crises. Yeah, I absolutely agree with, with Jonah. And I think what we're looking at is a period of correction. But I use that word sort of with reluctance because it depends on where you sit, what a correction feels like and the degree of pain it brings, right? So, I grew up in an automotive factory town. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. And, you know, I certainly remember how that correction felt, you know, to the people who are still recovering from changes in the like 1980s to the way that particular market works. So I have sympathy uh, for sure and concern for people who are going to pay the consequences for something they had nothing to do with, right? People will be hurt. On the whole, the economy is really strong. And with respect to the debt ceiling, it's, I would say, it's reckless to engage in these uh, brinkmanship schemes. And what we see, what we should be mindful of is SVB is a lesson in panic, right? And how quickly panic can spread, right? The last thing we need people panicking about is the US government maybe deciding not to honor its debts. We all know that's not going to happen, right? 
Like it would be ridiculous to crash the U.S. economy and the world economy just to score. I don't even know what political point that is trying to be scored, but it, it's something that um, a responsible adults should just not even be playing with. On that note, I'll let you both get back to work. But thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Walk in Fintech podcast. If you like the show, then please show us some love on social media or consider leaving a review. It means a lot to us and helps spread the word to more listeners. If you want more content from our fintech community, please subscribe to our podcast and find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Medium at Walk in Fintech. There you will find interviews, articles, videos, and much more analyzing all aspects of the industry. As always, special thanks to our editor, Rafael Osteria. Signing off until next time, I'm your host, Tarang Gupta. Thank you.